compute another partial derivative with the chain rule, but we're going to do a more complicated example this time. So we're going to start out with a W that looks similar. I'm actually going to pick an easier <coughs> W. So we won't even have a product rule. I think we had a, or a constant multiple rule. We don't even really have, have that here. Uh, <coughs> this time around, x, y, and z are going to be functions, each functions of two variables. So before, they were functions of just t. Now they're going to be functions of two variables. If you eat quietly, <laughs> which you're already not doing well at. So x is r over s. We're actually going to use r and s instead of s and t. Let's just use s and t. I'll just change. So x is t over s. y is t squared plus ln s and z is 2t. So there are lots of partial derivatives we could find. We're going to find dw. <coughs> so when you take derivative of w, I could use a partial with respect to x, y, or z. So that's one option. The other option I could use is instead of just going for partial of x, I can go for partial of t or partial with respect to s. So there's really five variables I could take a partial. Now, partial x, partial y, partial z are way faster to compute. There's no chain rule. So let's go ahead and get those partials first. They're going to be way faster. Uh, so I, I won't even write what we're finding until uh, we write these partials. So there's a wx wy, wz. These are super easy to compute. So I'll do the x derivative is 1. Oh, it's going to be actually too easy. Let me go with uh, x cubed. There we go. So my x derivative 3x squared. When I take the x derivative, is there anything else? Do I get some type of x prime or, or anything else after this? So I took an x derivative, so it's just, you could write dx dx, but you see that's going to turn into a 1. So you could explicitly use a chain rule, but you don't need to use it here. The other derivatives are 0 plus 0, so I'm not going to write those. Because they are all constants. They got no x constants. terms. So yes, they're constants in the x derivative. Okay, and then when you go to the y, it'll be the same for the other two. Yep, when y is, a, this particular function is, the variables are separated. I think our last one, they were there was like one product where they were mixed together. But this one, I chose a really easy w in this example, because what we're going to do next is a little more tricky. Yeah, All right, so I get wy and wz right now. And now I'm going to put this together with the gradient. Do you remember the gradient operator did the partial derivatives? So gradient w, it's going to be the wx, wy, wz. So that's gradient of w. I think they called the del operator. Was that the other name for it? Or Nabla, whatever that is. Okay, so that's <coughs> the partial derivatives with the variables inside W. Now we're going to go for another partial. And I can either do dr, d, or dt, or ds. Let's go for the s derivative of W. So that top part that we just see, that would be like one question that would be completed? That's, that's uh, no. Part. So this, the question that I would ask is this one right down here that I wrote down. Okay. In order to do that, I just computed the gradient or the... Uh, the the, the upside-down triangle thing. Yeah. It's a gradient. Okay. 
Okay. So in order to pretty much even start the question, you have to like get to that step. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I could have written down find this thing first. Uh, oh, you all right. Just started from like that. that I need this is this was something I needed to do on the way, right there. Okay. Is that delta or d? Those are deltas. Uh, how would I know they cannot be regular derivative? How do I know this is a partial? So partials have the deltas, regulars have d. How do I know this is a partial and not a regular derivative? You said the other variables, uh, well, you said the other variables to be constants? So if you look at our x, y, z, there's two variables going into x, y, and z. So I have to decide if I want, I can't just say derivative with respect to the variable. There's two variables, so that's why I'm using partials here. Before, in our last example, I think they were all functions of t, so there was only one variable uh, to take a derivative with respect to. So here we have the chain rule, dw, actually let's use the formula from the book, So is gradient W of, uh, now before it was alpha of T, now it's going to be alpha of S of uh, S and T. There's two variables here. And I'll write the alpha of S T right here. This function is the X coordinate T over S, Y coordinate T squared plus LN S, and Z coordinate is two T. So this is the alpha function of s and t. So that's what's different here is our alpha function has two variables. The formula I'm using, I'll go up and circle it. Here we go. This is the formula I'm using. I'll write the partial derivative version down. Well, alpha is going to have more than one variable. So I'm just going to write out. Uh, alpha like that and not write of other variables. So this is f of alpha dot. Now I can't write, it would be improper to write alpha prime uh, because we need to know what derivative of alpha I'm taking here. So I can't just put dot product alpha prime. Is so that uh, a b, d2 or is that the, the one thing that looks like a b? These are deltas. Yeah. You're talking about the? No, all the way to the left right of the screen. There's the thing that looks like a musical symbol almost. Those are deltas. Oh, those, those are deltas. Yeah. Okay. There's only two ways I'm going to write the derivative. It's the, the regular derivative is this one. Yeah, they look. And the partial good. is not. All right, so I can't write a prime. That's fine. This will be partial alpha over partial t. What I wrote down is pretty much exactly the same, though. It's just the partial version. So it's really no different. It's just the specific derivative you're taking of alpha. Um, quick question. Yeah. Uh, the operator of f, is what is that doing to the f of a? It's a good question. Because <coughs> so it looks like it's a scalar, but it's not. So you take the gradient first. So that's the, it turns the function f into basically n derivatives. In our case, it'll be the three derivatives we compute already. Uh, and then there's a function, this is really function composition right here. So you're composing the gradient with this alpha function. Okay. And then you're doing a dot product. So it probably, to show all the detail is this. Okay. And then this, this dot right here is the actual dot the geometric dot product that we're thinking of right okay. there. 
and in case it wasn't. So here, <coughs> the no notation I used here was gradient of f. I could put an extra parentheses, but it's going to get really busy if I do that. But you take the gradient, and then this is written with the composition notation already there. So it's not using the little circle. It's using the parentheses for function composition. So you could uh, wrap the delta f in parentheses, because they're supposed to compute the derivative first. All right, so let's apply that formula to what we're doing here. So we got gradient of w composed with alpha, the regular alpha function. And now we're going to dot product. Uh -oh. And dot product with what derivative should I take of alpha? with s, yeah. So you see right here, this is the s variable we want. So that's the out when, when I write alpha derivative, it's the s derivative. So we wrote that as d alpha over d s. So those are these? Deltas. Sorry. I'll probably say d and delta interchangeably. But uh, you are referring to separate things. Yeah, my D will always have a foot on the bottom, and the delta well. never will. Other than that, there may be a lot of variety between the two. Just look, it's kind of like my U's and V's. My U and V, that's V, that's U. They're the same letter with a foot on one of them. Which gets very close to phi, but that's a different story. All right, compute all this. We already got delta w, the gradient of w. 3x squared to 2z. We're going to compose that with the alpha function. It's a composition uh, symbol, function composition. And now we're going to dot product with the derivative that we're about to compute. So I need the s uh, derivative, so it's d alpha d s. This is probably the easiest part of this. <coughs> so we got negative t over s squared comma 1 over s comma 0. So any derivative, uh, s derivative alpha questions? Yeah, 1 over s, because that's a derivative of natural log. And the t squared is going to disappear, so we're, not, we're taking an s derivative. All right. Let's, the only tricky part now, dot product is going to be easy when we do it. Function composition, not easy. So let's do this. This is a slightly weird way to write out function composition. So let's look at the first term here. The only term I need is x. I don't need y and z in this first term. What is x? So it's t over s. So that's our x coordinate right there. And it's going to be composed, so it's going to take the place of x. So that's our first coordinate right there in our vector. Second coordinate, there's nothing to do, just 2, it's constant. Third coordinate, is 2z. So what do I fill in for z now? 4t. Or just for the z part? Oh, just 2t. 2t. So this is our composed vector function. And it should be a function of s and t. 
and the output should be the same dimension as our original gradient was in. So it's outputting to three dimensions with two-dimensional input, S and T. That middle term, uh, the two, that, that would go into the T squared plus ln. So are you worried that we didn't use this one? Yeah. Okay, that's reasonable. When would, what would indicate that I needed to use this middle term? There's a Y. So all of our Ys disappeared. It was also coincidence that the first term went into the first term. If I chose a different function, that first term may have gone into all three terms. If there was an X in all three positions. Does that make sense? So there's not, it's not first term to first term, second to second. It's wherever X, you see X, you're going to choose the alpha version. So it's basically the first coordinate of the alpha function. So yeah, th so this is function composition in higher dimensions. And it's a little bit strange. No, it's a bit strange, I guess, in lock. All right, excellent. All right, so again, not a dot product. That's function composition. That's why I intentionally drew a circle with nothing in the, the middle. That's function composition notation right there. All right, now we got an easy dot product. This is just geometry. You can do this dot product super easy. So take the dot product. So that is our rate of change of the W function in terms of the variable S. This does not mean along the x-axis or the y-axis or the z-axis. This means along, uh, in this case, the surface alpha in the direction of S. How do you uh, write your x's and fives? The There's no fives on the board. The dirty secret is my fives are just like my S's. <laughs> but don't tell anybody. All right, so that is chain rule with partial derivatives. All right, I want you to find dw dr now. Or delta W, delta R. Oh, there's no R. There's T. So if I actually ask for your delta W over delta R, that would be zero, because there's no R. So it's not going to change when I change some variable R. Uh, DW over DT will not be zero, hopefully. So I'll leave all the original work on the board here. You're still using delta W, so you don't need to recompute delta W. That's still going on in this. So what I circled, or put a box around, is not going to change. Alpha is the same, and delta W is the same. So that's not changing.
Any questions on this partial? So now we're going to look at a uh, more geometrical way of looking at the uh, derivative. So we're going to take things back to dy over dx, which is one of the first ways you looked at derivatives. It was basically rate of change of the is a rise over the run, basically, the standard way that we learned about slope. So let's begin with a function w, which will be of x and y. dw over all right so in my notes I gotta think of why I wrote this no, nothing's working Race. All right. So on the notes, I've written the x derivative of w is zero. So we need, all right, so we needed that condition as well. So with that condition, now we can say the derivative w, which is a constant, is zero. So if w is, if the w function is constant, then the derivative will be zero. So if the w of it doesn't have to be zero, it be? No, I mean, this is, in some sense, it's, it's a boring function because the output's constant. Uh, well, in here it can be any function of x and y. So, for example, what if I had the function x squared plus y squared minus 1 equals 0? What would that be? That's a circle. What's the radius? 1. So the function could, uh, the graph of the function could be a nice shape like a circle. Uh, and the w function basically would be the height above the function. So in this case, the circle would be on the ground. So the height would always be zero. It's not exciting in terms of the height of the circle, but you can look at the graph of the equation. Uh, so we get dw over dx is zero because our function is constant. So that's the reason it's zero. Now what I'm going to use is the formula that we wrote down a minute ago, which is, let's see, delta f 
of just regular x, y. This is not composed with alpha. Just delta f dot. Uh, now it's dot with a vector. <coughs> One of these d's is a delta, and I'm not sure which one it is. Hmm. It's probably the numerator. You can have a delta and a d in the same. Yes. So this is fx comma fy dot product Oh, these should be dx on the bottom, not del not dy. <coughs> So I may mess the D and the delta up. They may have to be swapped, but that's okay. If they do, we'll just change it around at the end. Uh, I want to solve for dy over dx. So you subtract the f of x, dx over d, uh, delta x over dx to the other side, then divide by fy? Yeah. And I think the way I have it written, I think we're solving, well, we'll see in a minute. Yeah, that's what's in my notes. I shouldn't have doubted my notes. So first of all, fractions suck. What can I multiply by? Dx. And now we can, let's see, subtract. I want, well, it doesn't really matter which one we subtract. We'll just take dx the other side. Negative fx dx equals fy dy. I want to solve for dy over dx, so we'll just divide by dx. dy over dx equals f negative fx over fy. All right, so that's the slope that you're thinking of. Well, the slope that you used to think of. Now you're thinking of it again. Now, it did require that the function equaled zero. It would have worked to the function it was a constant as well. But you did have to have that relationship in order for this to work out. So we'll do one example based on this. So let's make this more difficult. Let's go to three dimensions. Uh, no, this is a formula. Okay. The other problem finish when you do that line, right? Yes, right. correct. 
And so I want to find those two at 0, 0, 0. When x cubed plus z squared plus y e to the x z plus z cos y equals 0. So to make this look like the previous uh, formula, I'm going to call this whole thing capital F of x, y, z. The reason I had to switch to partial notation is because before x and y were directly related. If you look back here, we had an equation with x and y and 0 only. There was no third variable in here. So if you change x, y would change. If you change y, x would change. So this is a regular, not a function. You can't necessarily write x as a function of y or y as a function of x. I did a nice example right here, an easy. Uh, that's a circle. You can't solve for x. You can't solve for y. However, you can still find the derivative of x and the derivative of y without being able to just solve all the way for x or y itself. So we go down here, we have partials. So I'm going to do the x first. So remember, there's no try, there's only do. So let's think about what we got here. So basically, the two variables traded places and became negative. So is there negative reciprocals of their derivatives is what this is. So we're going to have fx divided by fz. That's dz over dx. And the second one, dy over dx, is similar. It's going to be negative fx over fy. So compute these right now. And you should be getting uh, not vectors out of this, but just a single expression. It might be ugly and complicated, because I can see some product rule ahead of us. This might be your first non-trivial partial derivative. Hopefully you did a few homework problems that were partial derivatives, but this is the first one I'm doing that's not what I would call trivial. The other ones were, I don't even think, we maybe had a constant multiple rule was the toughest thing we had to do before. So this is way past constant multiple rule. Um, in your x, x, why is there an extra x in the y, e, x, z? That's a good question. Why is there an extra x? chain rule. So it was the x derivative of xz. Like I was saying, it should be a z right there. <laughs> All right, so that's fx. <laughs> Fy. I think it came from a hallucination. I don't even see it. I don't know. I thought that Z was a Y for half a second when I was writing. <laughs> Z. All right, so I get the right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 
that should be a sign. <coughs> Alright, does that look okay? Alright, so all you gotta do is write the proper ratios of these. So, the first one, we got negative fx, 3x squared plus z, y e to the x, z divided by our fz, 2z plus x, y e to the x, z plus cos y. Negative fx. So those are our slopes. So one of them tells you how you are going. So if z is up, the first one tells us how much we go up when we move forward. And the second one tells us how much we move whatever, let's say, we'll sorry, I do too much stuff inside of Unity, so Z is always forward in Unity, but your Z is always up. It's all arbitrary anyways. Uh, so the second one tells you how Y is changing when X changes. Let's just say that and not worry about what direction X and Y are going. So the second one tells you when X is changing, this is how much Y is going to change. Derivatives are finished, for now. So what comes after derivatives? Integral. Integrals. Integral. Integrals. Integral. Or antiderivatives. So that's what we're going to be doing next. You're going to come back and do more derivatives in chapter 14. So we're only doing half of 14 and then half of 15. So we're doing two halves. So you'll come back and finish the two halves of those two chapters, and then you'll do 16 as well. 16 is where it gets real. Really? Oh yeah, that's Green's theorem, Stokes theorem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for Doctor Dude's theorem. Oh, there's no Doctor Dude theorem. Yet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to integrate over rectangles. So we started by integrating over intervals way back in the day. And the easy two-dimensional version of a re the easiest region in two dimensions is a rectangle. Well, I guess the easiest one would be a rectangle of zero width and zero height, but that's area would be zero or volume would be zero. So the next easiest one is a rectangle. So that's where we'll start. Region uh, is it I O N? Is there an I in that word? Yeah, region. Region, okay. Yeah. Seems like it should be region. All right, region. All right, we'll take our. Quick question before we begin. begin. Yes. Yeah? Double and what integrals over rectangles? Iterated. Iterated. What does that mean? Iterated. Do one, then the other. Okay. Uh, do it. In order, I think that would be serial instead of parallel. Parallel is kind of like doing both at the same time. Okay. Not parallel in the geometry sense, in the time sense. Okay. So serial in the time sense. Serial is related to series. Okay. When it comes, to, it just means do this, then that, then that, then that, then that. Okay. Yes. I like a serial number. Different than a serial eater. <laughs> <laughs> Although if you put them both together. Probably not really. <laughs> 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 you get a zombie. <laughs> serial killer plus serial eater equals serial killer. Or eater of serial. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here is a rectangular region. So all the x's go between a and b, all the y's go between c and d. I'm going to assume that they're positive so I can write it out super easy. So the region that we're describing is this rectangle here. So 
that would be S. So any questions about that set notation or what we're talking about? There's another way to write out S. So I wrote it out as an interval cross an interval. So what interval do I mean when I say AB? This interval right here is the interval AB that I just drew in green. So that's our AB. Here is CD. CD is vertical. And when I cross them, I get the rectangle. So this is just a shorthand way of writing out the set instead of writing all elements, all numbers in this set, cross with all numbers in this set, you can just cross the sets themselves like that. So any questions about that, that idea? This is going to let us do things a lot easier when it comes to actually integrating. <laughs> so we're going to look at surfaces over S. So now I'm going to attempt to draw this in three dimensions. So our set S is going to be a rectangle, which when we start to draw with perspective, that's a, well, if you use an orthographic view, that would be a parallelogram. If you have a, what do they call it, vanishing point, it's not quite a parallelogram, but I think you get the point. <laughs> so a surface is going to be, just think of it like a sheet over top, or a maybe a altitude of the ground over some uh, rectangle. So that's supposed to be kind of like a almost a parachute-shaped uh, cloth over top of that uh, square. So what we're going to do is basically compute the volume if I connect these two shapes together. So if we drop some vertical lines straight down, we're going to compute the volume of this area right here the volume of the area. We'll compute the volume of the shape. It's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how in the world, way back in Calc 1, where we were doing one-dimensional, uh, integrating across one-dimensional region with one dimension on the height, how do we compute that area? So, but how do we actually compute the area under our curve? Before, we knew about the antiderivative. So we, so we broke, we subdivided, and before it was little rectangles, and then we basically added up those areas. And the way we got the actual area, we took the limit, so we added up infinite rectangles, and that was the actual area. So let's think, how would I subdivide this shape? Cubes. Cubes pretty good. So there'll be rectangular columns, go ahead and describe it. So let's go here to the base, and what I'm gonna do is start subdividing. So we're going to cut it into tiny little, uh, there'll be tiny little rectangles, and then we're going to compute the volume of each little tiny rectangle. So the way we estimated, I'll just draw the first rectangle here. Ooh, I think the pen is way too wide to do what I'm doing. That's going to look really bad. One thing we did was we basically picked one height for the entire, uh, for that entire column. So we took the top of the column to be flat. So we had to pick a single height value. So that was the way we kind of simplified it. Before, I think I just defaulted to the right endpoint, but now there's 
kind of four you could use right here. So let's go with the upper right or the back right. I'll go purple so that we'll use that one right there. So that's that one will actually go off the height. So the area will be, it will get the base area, which is easy to compute, multiplied by the height, and that'll be the volume of our, uh, the volume of our rectangular prism. So unfortunately we gotta wait till Monday to get to this.